Hey guys, so I recently purchased a 3Com Etherlink 3 network card. If you haven't seen the video where I repaired this card, you really should check it out. It's on the hardware compatibility list of a lot of old Unix operating systems. And that's exactly what I want to test today. I've got a copy of Sun Microsystems Solaris 2.4 for x86, and I'm going to install it on this 486DX33 with 16 megs of memory. Now, in case you're not familiar with Solaris, it was a Unix variant produced by Sun Microsystems. Originally, it was intended for their Spark-based processors, but it was ported to the x86 platform in the early 1990s. Now, this is not an operating system you would have been running as a typical home user. This was designed for professionals, engineers, CAD designers, and honestly, mostly people who were already part of the Sun Microsystems ecosystem. If you were a sysadmin or maybe a developer in a Sun environment, it would have been very handy to have a Sun system at home that you could work on. Now, of course, Sun offered a lot of Spark-based workstations, but honestly, they were prohibitively expensive. The x86 variant of Solaris was a good alternative. So I'm booting from the installation floppies, and we're going to do a CD-ROM-based installation of 2.4. Now, with Solaris, it was possible to install over the network. In fact, I may try that in a later video. By the way, this part of the footage is sped up by a factor of 10. Loading those drivers and booting the kernel took a relatively long time on this old computer. I actually worked for one of the outsourced branches of Sun Support back in the mid-2000s, so I have a bit of a soft spot for old Sun equipment. At one point, I had quite a collection of Sun servers. I even considered buying a small rack to mount all of the equipment. But I left that job in 2010, actually just before Oracle purchased the company. The first part of the installation is, of course, text-based. I believe this is 720 by 400 resolution at 70 hertz. Now unfortunately my capture card can't sync to that resolution. Okay, is this a 19 inch monitor or a 17? I think it's only a 17. That's too bad, I could have used those extra two inches. And we've got a serial mouse. And now it switches over to 640 by 480 with 16 color, so I can start using my USB video capture device. So that window at the top of the screen, that's the system console. Any relevant error messages will pop up in there. Okay, we need a host name. And this system will be called Emily. You'll notice I use that name a lot for my systems. This is going to be a networked system. And we've got an IP address of 192.168.2.26. And it's curious, DNS does not show up as an option here in the available naming services. You got to remember, this is from 1994. The world was a little different back then. Okay, good. There's our net mask. And we need to pick a time zone. I'm in GMT minus four or Atlantic Canada. 
Now I don't care about the date or the time. Now I checked in the BIOS, and this computer will actually accept dates up to 2099, which is pretty impressive for a 486. Now I could have gone with a standalone system here. I wasn't entirely sure what they meant by server. But it appears to be for connecting multiple diskless clients to the system. I'm not going to be doing anything complicated like that. So we'll simply zero out that information and move on from there. If you're doing this at home, I would actually go with a standalone system. And we've got a 512 meg compact flash card here, so I'm simply going to install the entire distribution. Okay, we need to partition that drive. Now I'm going to let Solaris auto partition the drive, and then I'll probably tweak it afterwards. So let's see what it gives us for an auto layout. Now it was pretty common back in the day to use a separate partition or even a separate hard drive for various directories under the root file system. As you can see, Solaris wants to create a separate export home partition. Really not necessary in my case, so I'm going to remove that export home. And we'll simply allocate all of that space back to the root partition. I'm also going with a 32 meg swap. With 16 megs of memory, a 32 meg swap should be sufficient. And we're not going to be mounting any remote file systems, not for the moment at least. Now just review all that info. And now I'll reboot on my own after we're finished. Okay, now Solaris indicates it's going to take between 15 minutes and two hours to perform the install. That was actually a fairly accurate estimate. At this point, it did take around an hour and a half or so for the base installation. And just a few more things it needs to install. After the base installation is complete, there's a driver update disk that Solaris will request, and then it performs a series of patches. They actually took almost as long to install as the base operating system. So we're looking at another hour and a half, maybe even two hours, before this is finished. Obviously, I'm going to skip that as well. On the initial boot, I was prompted to create a password for the root user. But curiously, it didn't ask me to create a non-root user. Now, of course, for safety reasons, I will be creating a non-root user for daily use. As with any Unix variant, you should really only log in as root when you need to do some sort of system maintenance. It's far too easy to damage the system while logged in as root. Unix won't prevent you from doing things that might potentially damage the system. As I heard one sysadmin say, if the operating system stopped you from doing stupid things, it would also stop you from doing creative things. Now, Solaris didn't automatically put me into the graphical environment. I had to launch OpenWin. That's the Open Look Window Manager. The graphical environment was pretty resource intensive. 
And really, depending on what you were using the computer for, you may or may not have needed it. If you were running Solaris purely as a server, well, you really don't need a graphical environment on a server, do you? Now, the first thing you notice, even by 1994 standards, this GUI is pretty basic. Granted, we are running in 640 by 480 with 16 colors, but it's still somewhat underwhelming. Once again, this is not a home user operating system. It was targeted at engineers, developers, and sysadmins. It's a no-nonsense desktop for people who want to get something done. So if I pull up a command prompt, I can do an IF config, and we do indeed see that network card, the ELX0. I want to connect to my NFS server, but that's on the 10 dot network. So I'll change this IP, and I'll use the NFS server to test the network card. So let's try and ping the NFS server first. Server is alive. Now I'm going to mount the NFS share on the slash MNT directory. As you can see, that is an empty directory on my Solaris 2.4 box. Okay, if I issue the mount command and verify that it is indeed mounted, yeah, there it is there. And now if I recheck that MNT directory, you can see we do indeed have files in there. That information is actually not on this computer. That's sitting on the NFS share across the network. So I can unmount that and pop back into that directory. And once again, that is empty. So the network card is clearly working properly. So let's check the netstat command and see what ports are open. On an early, early version of Solaris like this, there was no firewall, and there were a lot of services running, quite frankly, for security reasons that really shouldn't be. This netstat command is listing all of the open ports on the system. And you see we've got FTP and Telnet wide open to the outside world. I'll have to lock that down later on. But either way, we've got a full install of Solaris 2.4 x86 and a fully functional network card. I'd call that a win. Now, unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of software ported to this version of Solaris, so I don't have a lot of applications that I can demonstrate here. In the next video, I'm going to upgrade to Solaris 2.5. It had widespread adoption, and a lot more applications were ported to the platform. So if you enjoyed this one, please feel free to like and subscribe, drop a comment down below, and as always, thanks for watching.